Okay, well, thank you all for coming. I'm really happy to see such, such a big bunch of people. And um, I think you're probably going to be staying with, within voice range. So can everybody hear me? Yes, if you can't, you didn't hear the question. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good deal. All right, well, I'm going to walk into uh, the Abbey. This is, uh, this is not exactly a replication of uh, Mendel's Abbey. I think the architecture is probably all wrong. But it was built to represent Mendel's Abbey and gardens, which is still uh, standing. It's now the Mendel Museum. Oh, is the mic up too high? Let me fix that. Is that better? Okay. Well, this this area of Genome Island is about uh, about the Mendelian laws and early studies on the rules of inheritance. So we'll walk into the Abbey right now. This is where I usually start my classes. Uh, I figure that while the kids are getting used to Second Life, uh, it's simpler if they all just sit. And this table expands. I, I think I won't ask you to try uh, taxing its limits, but you probably could all sit here. Because every time somebody sits down, well, you've seen these tables before. Anytime you sit down, it puts a chair, another chair on that side. So it's very handy for uh, conferences or for meeting with a lot of people uh, all at the same time. Cool. So it's going to work. So mostly what this room is for, besides just conference meetings, is uh, to give some of the history about Mendel and his life and his work. And I always enjoy talking to the kids about Mendel because Mendel was sort of a first-generation college student himself. Um, he was, you know, the son of a tenant farmer and... He actually went into the monastery not because he had a particularly strong religious calling, but because it would allow him to continue his education. And I don't know too many people that would take the vows of, uh, of priesthood in order to continue their educations, but Mendel did it, and it worked out fine for him. Look at this table. This is great. I don't think I've ever had this many people at this table before. It's nice to know it works. Okay, so we're going to go look at the greenhouse. And fortunately, because it's Second Life, we can walk right through this back wall here and go into the greenhouse. So the greenhouse contains some um, simple... Mendelian experiments, for example, the monohybrid cross, which just involves one pair of genes, is right here. And uh, all of the objects, most of the objects will give you some kind of informational note card if you click on them. And in this part of the greenhouse, some of them will also give you a spreadsheet to put the data on. So, for example, this monohybrid cross.
starts with this poster. So if we cross yellow peas to green peas, the first generation is all the same, they're all yellow. And then we can click on that hybrid pea and get a dish full of peas that represent the next generation. So these are the progeny of the hybrid. And you can get data into the chat record just by clicking on the bowl and it will give you additional sets of progeny. Each time you may notice it's a little bit different than it was before. And so the data can be copied from the, the chat record into a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheets are available um, through a link that comes from several of the objects around here. So that's one of the things that's in here. Uh, another thing that's in here is a sort of little game that is based on the six possible crosses you can do with just a single pair of genes. This is the mating game over here on the opposite side of the room. And so these three sets of peas all represent those six possible crosses. So there's, there's two crosses for each dish. So you just click on one of the peas to get the cross between that pea and the pea on the top. And then by looking at the distribution of traits among the progeny, you can figure out which cross you're looking at, what the genotypes, what genes are present in the parents. So next we'll go out to the Die Harvard Garden, and I think I'll just go through this back door here. So what the dihybrid garden does is to illustrate the inheritance when you're dealing with more than one pair of genes. So we've got two pairs of genes represented here, either tall or short, and either red or white. So the two parents are in one of these dishes. The first generation progeny are all the same, and they're in this second dish that's rotating above the garden. And then the garden itself produces the progeny of the hybrids. Now, theoretically, you get a, uh, a ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, 9 for the two dominants, 1 for the two recessives, and then 3 for the other two possible combinations of progeny. And again, you get a different set of progeny every time you click on the garden, and that goes into the chat record, and you can paste it into the spreadsheet for analysis. So these represent the two Mendelian laws. The monohybrid cross in the greenhouse represents the law of segregation, and the garden out here represents the law of independent assortment, simply meaning that each pair of genes will sort out into uh, the eggs and the sperm independently of the others. Now, there were a lot of... Um, there were a lot of kinds of experiments that Mendel tried, but they didn't follow his rules, and he sort, of, he sort of gave up on them. But one of them was not the thing I'm going to show you next. He didn't try uh, X-linkage. I'm pretty sure he didn't, because he was dealing with plants. So we're going to go down to uh, the cattery. Actually, you can just click on the next landmark. Oops, am I following the rules here? Yes. Okay. Make sure everybody's down here. So there's a bunch of different experiments that can be done with cats, but I think the most interesting one is this one here, which represents the sex-linked gene for orange. So that gene for orange is on the X chromosome. And so it's expressed differently in males and females. 
And another weird thing that happens so with the X chromosome in mammals is that in every cell in a mammal, only one of the two X chromosomes is active, which makes it possible to have both of the genes on the X chromosomes in females expressed in different parts of the body. So you also have excellent genes, and you, if you are heterozygous for them, if you've got two different kinds of genes, you may be expressing different genes in different parts of the body if you're a female, but they don't show up in color patches like they do in these cats. So you see the kittens get patched, making uh, lots of kitten noises. And the nice thing about uh, this particular trait is that from just from looking at the kittens, you can actually predict the genotypes of the parents. So this is sort of a fun experiment to do. The shape of these cats is actually based on a, a, a simulation called Cat Lab that was made by the woman who is now chancellor of uh, a university in New Zealand somewhere. OK, so the next place we're going to go is uh, over to uh, where the bees are. Uh, the next thing we'll look at is the apiary. So just look for your apiary link, and we'll, uh, we'll go over there and take a look at the It have dark bodies and white eyes. And they should be coming out and they're not. Let's see why. Hmm. Well, they were working a while ago, but of course they're not working now. Okay, but we can see uh, the, the progeny of the cross between those two different kinds of bees. Mendel actually did some work on bees, but he couldn't figure them out. And the reason that he couldn't figure them out was that in bees and a lot of the other social insects, the males have only the chromosomes of their mother. So the males have only one set of chromosomes, and they get them from their mother. And the females get chromosomes from both parents, just like you normally expect. So he didn't know that about bees. In fact, I don't think Mendel, I don't think chromosomes had been discovered at the time that Mendel was doing his work. So he had no way to figure this out. Um, ultimately, uh, once the chromosomes had been discovered and seen, the, the problem with the different numbers of chromosomes in the two sexes was understood better. The other thing that's in this North Abbey garden are some other things that Mendel either didn't work with or didn't report, and that is traits that don't show complete dominance. So normally, if you, or frequently, if you cross individuals with have two different traits, you know, black versus white, for example, the progeny will express only one of them because one of the two traits is dominant. Um, and that's usually because the recessive trait is, uh, is, doesn't have a functional gene. It's not making a functional protein. And so it's just not expressed. However, in some cases, you do get partial expression when you have one dominant and one recessive gene. So you see that up here in this garden with the pink flowers. So in this case, the first generation of progeny between red and white flowers is all pink. And the progeny of the pink flowers are either red, white, or pink in different numbers. And again, this all goes into the chat record, which can be pasted into the spreadsheet. So the next place we're going to look at here is uh, the Mixolamas. And the Mixolamas actually started out to be hippos. I was trying to make hippos, and they just didn't look right. And so I made llamas instead.
Yes, different organisms have different numbers of chromosomes. Um, one of the interesting things about cats is that all cat species except one, and I can't remember which one that is, but it's not domestic cats, have 38 chromosomes, about 19 pairs of chromosomes, which is probably why you can get crosses between things like lions and tigers and, uh, and get progeny from that. Usually you can't do that between species, but with cats, uh, they don't seem to be quite as fully separated as some other species are. So what the mixed llamas are for is to show the different kinds of combinations you've got. So we've got six different body parts here that change colors on these guys when you click on them. And so if there are six different body parts, and each of them can be one of two different colors, basically dark or light, then there are 32 possible combinations of uh, different colored body parts. And so what I usually ask the kids to do is to click on them until the llamas are all one color. So the thing that doesn't change color are their legs and their ears. So when they're all the same color as their legs and their ears are, then they're done. And these little sticks beside the llamas keep track of how many times you've clicked. So the average number of times you should have to click to get them all one color is 32. But of course, you might get anything from you know one or two clicks to maybe 50 or 60 clicks before that happens. And so you can click on all six of the llamas and then just see what the distribution of uh, numbers of clicks is to get those. One of these is a little different from the others. This was my husband's idea, actually. He said, instead of using the sticks, why don't you have the llamas poop? And the poop can count the number of clicks. So this is the pooping llama over here. And sometimes I will come in and find a totally buried llama, which has hundreds of clicks on it and which has been totally buried in poop. So that can happen. Uh, and sometimes people will do it. Fortunately, I can undo them. So. <laughs> but um, that does actually make an interesting way to, to count the number of times you have to click it in order to get all of the same color. And you can do the same thing for any other pattern that you might want to look at. So any individual pattern will happen once, about once out of 32 times. So we can, we can check for that distribution of, uh, of traits. So the next place we're going to go is uh, up to the tower, which has a, a number of different activities, and we'll just look at a few of those. So we're going to go to the Tower Terrace and start from there. Picks the terrace because it's an easy place to spread out. Also, the terrace is one of the places that has uh, discussion areas where, where a small number of students can gather to discuss things, or I can gather with a small number of students to discuss things they might be having trouble with. There are a number of these around the island. There's a big conference room in the abbey. And there are maybe half a dozen different small conference areas in addition to that one. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to show you here, and I'm just going to walk up this ramp, is this is my office, which is much bigger than my office in real life, and also much neater than my office in real life. Uh, although there is a fruit fly floating in the coffee in the coffee cup, which actually does happen sometimes. Frequently when they're transferring the fruit flies, they will get away, and where they usually wind up is in the dean's office in his coffee cup. So I try not to let that happen, but sometimes it does. 
So this is where I have office hours. You see my office hours for last spring are listed up there. And so I just come in, log in, and the kids know I'm going to be here. So they have questions about anything, they can come at that these times and uh, chat with me about it. And I also frequently just drop in from time to time to see what's going on. So the tower is uh, where the molecular genetics is, and also some of the fruit fly genetics, some bacterial genetics, some human genetics. Uh, all of those things are represented in the tower. So I just want to show you a few of those. This first section, uh, the, the ramps, yeah, the ramps go all the way up, but there are teleporters, and I'll show you where those are in just a minute. So this is uh, some of the early history of how DNA was first identified as the material, as the, as the chemical that held the genetic information. Uh, and that was kind of a big surprise because DNA was thought to be basically too stupid a molecule to be able to have information. They thought for quite a long time that it must be proteins because proteins have do so many other things in the cell. They thought they might have enough informational um, flexibility to hold the information of the genes, but they don't. Turns out to be the DNA. And the first experiment that indicated there was some chemical holding genetic information was this one with the mice. So a bunch of different strains of bacteria were used, and um, the mice were injected with these bacteria, and sometimes the mice lived, and sometimes the mice died. And the mice died if they got bacteria that had a capsule around them, a carbohydrate sticky capsule on the surface that protected the bacteria from the immune system of the mouse. And so the bacteria that didn't make the capsule didn't kill the mouse, but bacteria that did make the capsule did kill the mouse. So what they discovered was that a combination of live bacteria that didn't kill the mouse and dead bacteria, which by themselves would not kill the mouse, produced bacteria that killed the mouse because the genes for making the capsule went into the live bacteria and had them um, converted them to bacteria that made the capsule which then killed the mice. And so once they knew that something from the dead cells was getting into the live cells, they finally figured out that what that something was was DNA. And so once they'd figured out that it was DNA, then they looked more at DNA, and ultimately Watson and Crick, who are shown in this picture here, um, figured out the, or promoted the, or proposed the double helix model for DNA structure, which you see here. And this is just the history of the development of that model. So what they used was information about the, uh, the nucleotides that compose DNA, um, information from the comparison of uh, base composition in different kinds of DNA that was done by a guy named Shargoff, uh, x-ray pictures of DNA crystals that were done by Rosalind Franklin, and all of that information was put together to make this double helix model of uh, DNA structure. And so that's how we got that model. So it's interesting because Watson and Crick didn't do a single experiment themselves, but they used the information that other people had collected to create the model. And the model made sense, and it even suggested a way for the DNA to replicate because there's a pattern to the pairing of the bases. A always matches with T, adenine always matches with thiamine, and G always matches with C. So you always get a CG pair or an AT pair. Because of that, if you separate the two different strands, you can predict what the other strand has to look like. And the cell does that just by matching up the bases to um, one of the two strands, and that's the way DNA replicates. 
And it turns out if it really does it that way. So the next thing we're going to do is click on this teleporter right here where it says teleport to level 7 chromosome cafe. We just click on that ball. That will take you up here to the chromosome cafe. The chromosome cafe is called the chromosome cafe because it used to have tables in it. But I took the tables out because it was sort of got crowded. So this is obviously the uh, a bunch of chromosomes, and these are this is the set of human chromosomes, and each of the chromosomes will give you information about itself. It'll tell you how many megabases of DNA there are in it, and how many genes it contains, and it will also tells you about uh, more about the chromosome and also more about one of the genes on the chromosome. These little arrows that you see here show where the gene that the chromosome tells you about is located on the chromosome. So this is just kind of an overview of the human genome. There's a bunch of other stuff that's on here. Um, I think I won't walk you around those. But uh, feel free to come back at any time and look at uh, some of the other human genes that are, um, there are activities. There are activities based on a number of other human genes like eye color, blood type, and things like that, uh, which you can play with. But the next place we're going to go is down to ribosome row. And ribosome row is a place that explains how the, the ribosomes take the information from RNA, which is a copy of the information in DNA, and use that to make proteins. So we'll go ahead and go down there now. So these are giant models of ribosomes. And proteins are synthesized in several stages. The messenger RNA, which is a copy of the DNA information, first has to bind to a ribosome. Um, and then transfer RNA, which is another kind of RNA, carries the amino acids and matches up with the messenger RNA. So you can get base pairs between different kinds of RNAs, just like you can get base pairs between the different strands of DNA. And that principle is used to match specific amino acids, which make up proteins, to the different coding units on the messenger RNA. So each messenger RNA can bind to a ribosome to tell that ribosome how to make a particular kind of protein. The next stage of that is shown over here. So there are several different binding sites for, RNA, for transfer RNAs in the ribosome. One of them always carries the growing strand of the, uh, the protein, and the other one is where the new... Where the, well, my dogs are upset about something. There's probably a cat outside. Um, so this, this A site is where the new transfer RNA always binds. And then the two amino acids on the two adjacent tRNAs will attach to each other and The next RNA that's given up its amino acid goes to the E site and then leaves the ribosome. And then the other two TNAs just, just move over one. And um, that happens again and again and again until you finally get to a stop signal. And there's actually a signal that says stop in the genetic code. In fact, there are three of them in the human genome. And that doesn't bind to transfer RNA. 
at that point, all of the amino acids are on the tRNA, which is in the middle site. And that one is just transferred to water, which completes the, uh, the structure of the last amino acid. And then that releases the amino, that releases the amino acid chain or the protein from the ribosome. So that's how the ribosomes do it. It's a fairly complicated process, but you can follow the stages during which that happens. The next place we're going to go is to the bioinformatics platform. Okay, well, what bioinformatics is about is a kind of combination of computer science and genetics. Uh, there are a huge number of databases available now that have protein sequences and DNA sequences and RNA sequences and genomic sequences and sequences for ribosomal RNAs and all kinds of things. And that information can be used for a variety of uh, purposes. One of them is to identify organisms that you may not even be able to see in an environment. Uh, for example, Craig Venter, who was one of the people that sequenced the human genome, did one of the first surveys of environmental DNA in the Sargassal Sea. So guess we'll see. He was using ribosomal genes as identifiers because each ribosomal gene is, uh, is unique in different organisms. And by just looking at the ribosomal genes, he found evidence for 1,800 different microorganisms just by looking at the DNA that was in the water in that area, in that region around Bermuda. He also found in that in those 1,800 samples, 150 previously unidentified species. So it can be used to uh, as, as a quick and dirty way to see what kinds of organisms are are in a particular environment, especially if it's aquatic. It can also be used to classify organisms. There's a beta globin alignment over here, and click on that. It will produce some informational notes. And it will also make a sequence alignment, but um, I don't see that right now. So this, this, the alignment that you can see, it just shows the differences between the genomes or the, the uh, beta globin sequences. And these are the protein sequences. 
But you can compare the protein sequences, or you can compare the DNA, or you can compare the mitochondrial DNAs, or you can compare the ribosomal genes. You can compare a lot of different things to uh, identify different organisms and also to see how they relate to one another. Uh, for example, using that, uh, that kind of technique, comparing different ribosomal DNAs, it was discovered that falcons are actually more closely related to parrots than they are to hawks and owls. So who would have predicted that? You can kind of see it if you look at the beak shape in falcons and in parrots. But uh, it's not some, I mean, people just thought, well, all the raptors must be related. Well, they're not. It turns out that the falcons are not as close to the other raptors as they are to parrots. You can also use it for answering different kinds of historical questions. For example, there is a, uh, an activity right over here with uh, different kinds of historical problems that have been solved using DNA. For example, the Romanov, uh, the, the bodies of the Romanovs, which were assassinated uh, during the, um, the uprising in, uh, in Russia, were identified using their DNA. And it was, uh, some of them were thought to be still alive, um, but they actually, <laughs> they actually did find their bodies. Um, another thing is the um, claim that Jefferson fathered some of the children of his, uh, one of his slaves, Sally Hemings. And so uh, a recent study has, has tried to answer that question. And it turns out that the Jefferson Y chromosome is in the male descendants of uh, one of the Hemings sons, uh, but not in, uh, in all of them. So those kinds of those are the kinds of things that can be done with bioinformatics, and it's lots of fun uh, to do those kinds of uh, projects. The next place we're going to go is to the um, eukaryotic walkway. And it says, it's eukaryotic genome boardwalk. So there are libraries of uh, both bacterial and uh, eukaryotic genomes. Uh, eukaryotes are things that have nuclei in their And this boardwalk gives some of the genomes, some of the many genomes that have been sequenced for different eukaryotes. And most of the genomes are some of the reference organisms that were first sequenced, like uh, horses, cows, dogs, possums. Some of them are organisms that have been more recently sequenced, like this Komodo dragon here. Um, the Komodo genome was sequenced uh, a year or so ago. Um, and if you click on these, you get information about the genome. And one of the interesting things about reptile genomes is that they are a lot like bird genomes in that in addition to relatively large chromosomes, they also have a bunch of teeny tiny chromosomes in them. So these are called macrochromosomes and microchromosomes. So both reptiles and birds have this combination of different kinds of chromosomes, which is yet another thing that, uh, that links the reptiles to the birds. In addition to uh, the genomic section down here, it gives the genomes of uh, the mitochondria or chloroplasts. So they're down in this section. So there are some mitochondrial and chloroplast genomes discussed down here. We've got bacterial genomes. Um, we've got some plasma genomes over in the garden of prokaryotic genomes. And then we have the organellar genomes up here, plus the nuclear genomes of a bunch of different kinds of eukaryotes. 
So those are kind of fun just to browse through. The next place we're going to go is to look at the population simulation. This is a, this, I didn't build this one myself. This was done by Kara Davidson. And we're going to go up there and take a look at that. I'll just wait a minute till everybody gets here. And in the meantime, the, uh, the birds and the moths are resing. So what this particular activity does is to reproduce an experiment or a set of observations that were made by a guy named Kettlewell on, uh, on moths. And he was interested in um, why the moths were changing colors. So this was a phenomenon called industrial melanism. So in the UK, when they first started uh, building a lot of different kinds of factories that were putting a lot of smoke out into the air, the trees and the bushes got darkened. And uh, so the, instead of, let me just change the color of this bark here. Instead of having a normal sort of uh, brownish bark with lichens all over it, um, the bark got all dark. And when the bark got all dark, he started seeing a lot more moths that had dark wings. And he decided that it must be because the birds were found it easier to find the, uh, the paler moths on the dark backgrounds than the darker moths. Um, and so this, uh, this simulation is based on that experiment. And so what it does is to res in a bunch of different colored moths. So you get some dark moths and some brown moths. You can see the brown ones very, very easily against the dark background. And you probably can't see the black moths. Here's one here. Here's one up here. They're a lot, uh, a lot harder to see against this background. Um, and once it gets set up, then the, the birds will start flying around and killing off the moths. And um, depending on the background, different populations of moths will survive. So against different colors of different colored backgrounds, different colored moths are at a selective advantage. So the brown moths tend to survive against the brown bark. The black moths tend to survive against the black bark. Um, you can show the difference between selecting for a, a, a dominant or selecting for a recessive allele. Um, you can also show genetic drift because uh, there's a third bark color here that uh, at which the moths are equally at a disadvantage. Um, leave that one. And you can show that uh, if you put the green bark up, that sometimes the black moths win and sometimes the brown moths win. And that is particularly pronounced if you start with a smaller population of moths. So if you start with a big population of moths, it may take them a while uh, to win. If you start with a small population of moths, one, one of the colors may disappear, disappear quite quickly. And I usually let it run for about 10 minutes. 10 minutes is usually long enough that you can see uh, the changes in the frequency of the different colors of the moths. This little ball here shows, uh, lists the numbers of different colors and the numbers, of the gene frequencies for the dark and the light moths, uh, respectively. Takes a little while for them to all get rest in. 
before you can see those numbers, I'll let it I'll let it run just long enough that you can do that. So once the birds start flying, the simulation starts running. They're getting pretty close to 50. Okay. All right, so you can see the elapsed time, and you can see, uh, if you get close enough to the ball, you can see how many moths there are of each color. Um, and if you're monitoring this uh, over time, then every minute you can uh, check on the numbers, uh, put that on a spreadsheet, run the graphs, and see how the the, uh, the population changes over time. Uh, I'll just let this run, and you can come back in a little while and look at it and see what's happening to these moths a little bit later, if you like. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is uh, the cell platform. I think this is the last place we're going today. So the cell platform has, um, I think it's 10 different kiosks. Yeah, I think it's 10. Um, that have different experiments related to cell biology. This actually used to be on a separate island. Um, which I really put together for a colleague who teaches cell biology. I don't teach it myself, but uh, I thought she might find it handy. But uh, when, they, when they were talking about um, raising the server fees for the educational islands. I actually moved all that over here. So this is what used to be on Cell Island. And in addition to a number of experiments that range from a study of macromolecules, experiments on enzyme activity, uh, different kinds of cell and tissue types. Uh, there's the part that, had, that does cell division or mitosis. And my favorite part is what you can see if you click on this big red arrow here, and that is the giant model of a cell. So you can get up on this uh, platform, and you can actually go into the cell. I guess I wish everybody gets a little closer. You can actually go into the cell if you just click on the plasma membrane. It will take you into the cell. And then if you click on the nucleus, you can go into the nucleus. And then you can fly around in there. Um, to get out of the cell, you have to do one of two things. You either have to find the exocytotic vesicle, which is over here. So you can click on this exocytotic vesicle to get out of the cell, or you can simply open your map and use it to teleport outside of the cell. So the different uh, structures inside the cell are active. You can see the, uh, the mitochondria are making ATP. Now if you click on them, you can start or stop this process. Um, also, the ribosomal subunits are coming out of the nucleolus, uh, and the ribosomal subunits actually aren't together unless they are actively synthesizing a protein. Otherwise, they're just separate subunits. So those are released uh, from the nucleolus. Uh, you can see the um, centrioles outside the nucleus, which are used for separating the chromosomes in eukaryotic cells. So this cell is kind of fun to walk around inside of.
And if you go inside the nucleus, you can see the uh, chromosomes. The chromosomes aren't condensed. They're not uh, individual chromosomes. What you can see is the separate chromatin that makes up the chromosomes. So you're seeing a bunch of strands of uh, chromatin in there. So it's kind of fun to walk around in and look at the different cell organelles. And I think I'll stop at this point and see if anybody has questions. I haven't actually been watching the chat log, so. Okay, I got it up now. I have a, a question. Yes. Um, when you use this to teach, um, I can imagine two modes. One is you bring students in and they walk around like we did and click on things. <coughs> and, and another mode, if students are not able to get into Second Life, you would either make a video of a demo or, or you know, have somebody go through and do the things while they're watching and saying, do this, do that. Have you, what kinds of ways have you explored using this to teach? Um, I always bring the students in. Um, there are some times that, uh, okay, I, I teach two kinds of courses in here. Um, I'm semi-retired right now, so I'm only teaching my non-majors course, which is a course I teach entirely in genome. So I teach use the Abbey and the bioinformatics platform and the tower activities. Um, for, for teaching that non majors course. But I actually bring them in and I have a, a set of activities for them to do assignments that are related to those and then quizzes that are related to the assignments. But all of the information um, is in here. Um, oh, forensic DNA, that would be interesting. I have not done anything specifically on forensics, but it would make an interesting um, It'd make, it would make an interesting um, feature. Yeah, that would be a good thing to do. Thanks for that, that suggestion. One of the things I have done recently is uh, up in the tower, right up near the top, there is a, um, a, a it's not really an activity, it's more like a display. Because uh, when Donald Trump was getting confused between the influenza virus and, and coronavirus, I thought, well, I need to put something up on genome that shows the difference between those two viruses because they're really quite different from each other. And so that's up near the top of the tower if you're looking at that. Uh, there are, there may be videos about Genome Island. I, I have not made many videos myself, but I have just started making some recently. Yeah, viruses do a lot of different things in their host cells. Genome Islands, uh, I've been using Let's see, I think this has been here since 2007. Um, I used to have a lot of these activities on the mainland in a different place, but I, I ran out of space. Um, and so I, I moved into uh, this, what was then the Sidelands and put this island up and uh, spread, the, spread the activities out around that island. So I've been teaching here since 2007. I have tried to get um, some of my colleagues into Second Life. For example, I have a, I have a friend who's um, a, an evolutionary biologist, and I've tried to get him to use the population biology simulation because it's so good. It's just an excellent simulation. Um, and I thought he was going to come in when we all had to go online after the virus. Easy. After the virus um, sort of took hold and everybody went online, I thought, oh, maybe more people will use Genome Island. 
and more people have been using Genome Island, except not from my school. <laughs> so he was going to try it, but he chickened out at the last minute. Uh, one of the reasons I think was because they shut down the campus, and uh, I, I think he really wanted me to kind of show him the way through it, and he didn't didn't feel comfortable just coming in by himself. But I love teaching here. I, I, I think I actually have a lot more interaction with the students that are in the online class than I do, that I did with my uh, full-time face-to-face students. Did I miss any other questions? I just want to compliment you on how relaxed you are teaching us all this deep stuff. It's really cool. It's very effective. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, I love doing it. I've been doing it a long time, and uh, I'm still learning how to do this. I I probably go through and restructure some of the activities in the non-majors course every time I teach it. I, oh, by the way, I don't use voice when I'm teaching. I only use text when I'm teaching because I can um, record the orientation sessions or I can record the conversations that I have with the students, and they're searchable. It's hard to search voice. So the, um, they, they seem to work with it just fine. Uh, yeah, the mitochondria probably don't move around that much in the cytoplasm. I have them move so they can trail the, um, art, the, the ATP out behind them. Oh, well, gosh, maybe two years um, for most of the, most of the items, but I'm, I'm always putting up new stuff, so... Maybe you could put another year up. It, it takes a while to, to build this stuff, as those of you who've done building know. And this is all very, very low-level building. I mean, when I, when I first came into Second Life, there weren't any mesh items or any of that. Uh, I've taken advantage of some of the mesh, mesh items for decorating the, the, uh, the island. Um, but none of the actual activities are mesh, I don't think. I'm pretty sure they're not. Oh, what an interesting idea. A, a model cell being infected by a virus. That would be an interesting thing to do. Complicated. But it would be interesting. Yeah, I might get better try. Uh, yes, they're all, it's all scripted. Um, it's, um, yeah, doing, I'm, I'm not a, an expert programmer by any means. I've done some programming in BASIC, but um, I've modified a lot of uh, different scripts. For example, the, the dihybrid garden where the flowers pop up and down, that used to be a light bulb script, and uh, I just changed what it did. Yes, that's a centriole with microtubules. Oh, cancer would be interesting. Now, the problem with cancer is the cells moving around where they're not supposed to be, so I'm not sure that would be sure. Uh, I don't know. I guess I could have the cells moving around the place, but... Um, that would that would be more difficult, I think, to to do, at least here. But I do like the idea of a viral infection. That might be interesting to try. I still refer to the cytoskeleton. Um, is it called something else now? <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, Stephen, you'll have to talk to me more about that. Lysosome storage diseases. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, when I first put the Abbey up, it was too small. Uh, it was it was more like, you know, real size, but you've got to make your buildings big in Second Life because um, otherwise, well, if you, if you think about having a building that's got an eight-foot ceiling or something like that, that's going to be too small. Uh, mitosis is on a kind of... Um, there's a, there's a teleporter that takes you out to the mitosis. It's on a separate platform adjacent to this, uh, to this platform here. Oh, yeah, kind of. Hmm. Oh, you know, I get my best evaluations in the online class, which is probably because the students don't have to deal with me in real life. I had this sort of um, grim looking face that they don't have to, um, and I, I think they think I'm grumpier than I really am. Um, so I think part, it's partly that students don't have to look at me, but I think it's also that they, they feel more in control here than they do in face-to-face uh, in -face classes. Yeah, they do, they do have to pay more attention. I mean, they have to take a lot more responsibility for their learning. I mean, I'm around a lot um, to help them answer questions or uh, if something's not working, you know, to help them help them solve the problems. But um, when when they when they have to do the assignments, um, they have to do them. And I've got stuff all over the island that's um, some of which was also made by Kira, the same person who did the population thing, that um, tells me who's here, how long they were here, what they're interacting with. I keep pretty close, I monitor them pretty closely. Um, and, you know, if they try to turn in an activity or turn in a, an assignment without having done the activity, I say, hmm, you haven't done the activity. So they have to go back and do the activity. But this is open access, so feel free to stop by any time and play with it. Uh, I don't think you can hurt it, so um, feel free. Yeah, Kira's a terrific scripter. Thank you, and thanks for coming. And feel free to come back and visit. And bring your students. Oh, thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Mike. Chantal. And, uh, and thanks for inviting me to do this, because I really enjoyed it. Oh, good. I'm, I'm glad you said that, because um, I've told you I've just been making some videos, and sometimes they, they make this sort of auto-closed captioning line on it. And they come out so strangely sometimes. I think I must be mumbling. Thanks for coming, Jenny.
Annie, is your, your real name Millet? Because I have a lot of second cousins named Millet. Okay, well, if you think of a question uh, that you have, just IM me and I'll get back to you. My pleasure, Jess. <laughs> it would be fun to uh, have the spindle actually attached to you, but I think that might be beyond my scripting abilities. Oh, our poor research students. They got thrown off campus with it when they were halfway through their research projects. <laughs> yes. That's what it's for. <laughs> oh, yes, you can ride the mitochondria. <laughs> I am enjoying it, Stephen. It's, I mean, I, I love teaching, um, and so I'm so happy that I'm still teaching the one class. And I hope I can keep teaching it until at least as long as my brain works. A 65 pound dog in my lap. <laughs> oh, dude. Well, she used to sit on my lap all the time when she was a puppy, and she just never stopped. <laughs> Did you?
Oh, tagline, look for the exocytotic vesicle. Or else just open your map. And, are you really trapped? Uh, just open your map and tell, teleport out. Oh, okay. That vesicle's over there by Hades. <laughs> 